Uh, so next, we're going to start with our 6.2, our 906 AM item, consideration of update on COVID-19. And today with us, we have Dr. Dr. Charlie Evans. Welcome. Oh, and you're muted. Is that better? Yes. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for inviting me back to speak to you, uh, you uh, about COVID-19. Um, Sarah Mariko's prepared a very nice epidemiology report, which I think we'll start with that. So if we could put those slides up. And hopefully somebody is able to do that because I do not have those slides. I think that. Uh, Johanna has the slides and Matthew both. Johanna or Matthew, are you able to put them up? Yeah, let me find them really quick, sorry. Well, she's getting those up. I can go ahead and speak to what they're going to show us. Um, you know, in, in general, what we're seeing with COVID-19 in the state is uh, a very, very gradual decline, but we're kind of reaching a shoulder or a plateau in that decline. So cases uh, throughout the state are still declining somewhat. And it looks like, here we go. So go ahead and go to the second slide. So here you can see um, within the state, we're at 12.2 new cases per 100,000. Uh, average daily deaths is down to 49 uh, per day. It's still very high, but uh, much better than it's been. And the test positivity is down to 2.4%. Go ahead, next slide. So I wanted to speak about vaccination coverage in Lake County. So um, these numbers reflect a change <clears throat> in the way we're uh, calculating them because we add all, added all the eligible five to 11 year olds. So it added 5,300 people to the denominator. So you might see that our percent vaccinated dropped because the denominator is bigger. So we're at 58% fully vaccinated, 7% partially vaccinated, and 35% unvaccinated. Next slide. So this is testing and positivity in Lake County. And this is encouraging news that our test positivity is, uh, has dropped 2.8% uh, from uh, the last time we reported. So we're, we're at 4.4%. We're well above where the state is, uh, but we're continuing to see a decline, which is, in my opinion, very, very positive information. Next slide. So this is just showing the, the two uh, big surges that we've had, and uh, we're down to 41 cases average per day. This is still way higher than we were at our, uh, our nadir back in June when, when we were down about uh, seven to 10 cases per day. And next slide. So, um, of those cases that we have, the majority are unvaccinated, uh, 333 or 74%, and about a quarter were fully vaccinated. So uh, again, we're seeing some breakthrough infections that uh, is a significant number, um, and I'll talk about that. And 10% were partially vaccinated. And next slide. So these lines were the green line on here. And if you look, uh, you see that the green line has uh, been coming down gradually uh, since uh, the middle of September uh, and it continues to go down. The blue line is the state line and it, it's fairly flat. The red line is uh, Mendocino County, and it, it is creeping up, which is a concern to me to have uh, a neighboring county with a rising infection rate because that could very easily spill over into Lake County. Okay, next slide. 
And this is the vaccination status for those that were hospitalized. And uh, again, the majority of the cases being hospitalized were unvaccinated, 79%. Uh, but this is less than uh, what we saw um, even a month ago, where it was more up in the 90% the range. So uh, again, I think this represents some of the breakthrough infections we're seeing with the vaccine and the waning immunity of the vaccine, which I'll talk about. And the vaccination status of the deaths. Uh, one of the deaths was uh, vaccinated, uh, eight were not. So we had nine cases from uh, September, uh, into September into through October. And next slide. Oh, I think that's the last slide actually. So um, while you're there, if you could also put up the slide that shows uh, where you can get tested and where you can get uh, vaccinated. Um, I wanted to make sure that information was out there for everybody. Um, there's quite a few vaccination sites and quite a few uh, test sites. Um, and for those that have internet, there's a link that can take you to those. Uh, if you don't have internet, there's a phone number that uh, can take you to those. So here are the links for the testing and for the vaccination sites, and then a, a phone number for where you can call if uh, you don't have internet services. Okay, so with that, I just wanted to uh, go on to my general comments. Um, you know, we've seen an overall decline in the numbers uh, in the past couple of months, and, and I'm really pleased to see on Sarah's report that it shows a continuing decline in Lake County. In other parts of the state, we're not seeing that decline. We're seeing a plateau or we're seeing a leveling or even a rise in numbers, and that's uh, being reported nationally now as well. So I, I think this is just a real warning to all of us that um, we could have a winter surge and we need to be very, very cognizant of this and um, apply all the public health measures we've learned throughout this pandemic. California is showing the same pattern of uh, uh, of decline and plateauing that India showed after their Delta surge uh, last spring. Uh, the plateau did not come down to the same baseline level in, in uh, our state that uh, it had been in, in the spring or, or early summer of last year. And what we're seeing in different parts of the country, uh, the United States now is we're seeing surges and areas that, generally speaking, are less vaccinated than other areas. Um, we still don't understand a lot about this virus. We certainly don't understand why it surges and then for no reason retreats and then why it surges again. Um, but we've been through enough surges to know that it's, it's very capable of doing that. You know, we might think that that we're at a vaccination rate where that won't happen, but that's not the experience that we're seeing nationally or internationally. So a great example is the Netherlands. They, they were up at 68% and they completely opened up and, and declared that they were through with a pandemic only to go into a big surge and having to close down when all of their facilities were, were overrun with, with infections. So I think that could very easily happen in Lake County as well uh, if we're not very careful with the public health measures uh, particularly vaccination, but also masking, careful hand washing, good nutrition, social distancing, all the things that we've been talking about throughout the pandemic. When, when we first started talking about uh, this virus, we, we also talked about an a, uh, immunity called herd immunity. And, and we suggested that if we got to a point where 80% um, of the population was either infected or immunized, that we might develop herd immunity. Now, there's so many unknowns with this virus, and many of which we continue to learn on a daily basis. One of which we've learned is that the vaccine uh, does not have the long-lasting immunity that we might have hoped it had. We've also learned that the virus can mutate and create variants. 
The Delta variant is a monster. Uh, this variant is highly infective and it requires a much higher level of immunity within a community to quell ongoing infections. So that all has, has impact on whether you reach herd immunity. With, with the waning of immunity from uh, vaccinations, um, I think it's, it's not likely that we're gonna see herd immunity in our community for some time. And my personal feeling is, is that the Delta virus is infectious enough that if you're in public with a level of infection we have, you will get COVID if you're not vaccinated. Um, and herd immunity is not going to help you in that regard. I wanted to talk about the waning immunity. As, as you've all read, um, we've seen that boosters have been recommended. Uh, when, when the vaccine first came out, <clears throat> we boasted a very high effectiveness rate. Initial studies were upwards of 90% effective, which is unheard of for a vaccine. This is a superb vaccine. And what we're seeing now is that over time, starting at about two or three months, you see a drop off in that immunity, bringing the effectiveness rate down into the 70s or maybe even the high 60s in some people. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this isn't a great vaccine and, and, and I'm not discouraging people from getting vaccinated. This is a superb vaccine, but it's not a perfect vaccine. And um, as we learn more and more about it, we learn how to use it better and um, that's why these recommendations about boosters have come out. Um, it's fortunate that even though these vaccines do not protect people from infection as the immunity wanes, we have seen that they do protect them from severe illness and from death. And so it's a, it's a huge benefit that we get from these vaccines. But I, I want to be clear that the vaccine is a great vaccine. It's not a perfect vaccine and um, we need to modify the way we use it, which is why the boosters have come out. Um, the other factor on this is that those that, that are uh, getting sick from this vaccine who are vaccinated are oftentimes those that have comorbidities. Um, you know, they're respiratory illnesses, they have cardiac illnesses, they're immunosuppressed for whatever reason. These are the people who it's really important for them to get boosters, and it's really important for them to continue to heed the public health measures of masking, uh, social distancing. So I wanted to talk about the boosters. So the CDC recommended boosters for specific age groups uh, almost a month ago, particularly to the vulnerable populations. Um, last week, uh, CDPH came out and recommended boosters in the state of California to all those who thought they would benefit from the vaccine. Um, their caveat was that you should wait six months after the uh, Pfizer vaccine and six months after the Moderna vaccine, uh, two months after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. They also said that you can mix and match the vaccines. And uh, their message here really is that what's important is that you get a boost it doesn't matter if you had Pfizer, you can get a Moderna boost, or if you had Johnson Johnson, you could also get a Moderna or a, a Pfizer boost. What's important is that you get a boost. And I think what most public health officials are recommending is if you can get the vaccine that you had initially, that's the vaccine you should go for. <clears throat> if you can't, just get a boost. Another question that's come up that I've been asked a lot as well, does this mean that in another six months, we're gonna need another boost? And the answer to that question is we really don't know. So much is unknown on, on, um, on this virus and our growth of knowledge is expanding exponentially weekly. Um, we may need another vaccine in six months. Uh, it will depend on the variants. It will depend on our development of successful treatments and it will depend on your baseline health status and what the level of infection is in our communities. So we'll have to wait to see the answer to that question uh, six months from now. Holidays are coming up and I wanted to talk about the holidays because everyone's planning on gathering. And uh, this is a, when we started our surge big time last year um, with holiday gatherings, they were a, a big spreader event. And so <clears throat> ways that you can safely gather and prevent infection. Um, 
If you travel on the holidays, it, you should get tested before you travel and you should get tested after you travel. Antigen tests now are readily available in drugstores. Uh, there's testing available throughout the county at testing sites. If you get an antigen test, it should be done 24 hours before you travel and a, a PCR test 72 hours so that the result is back before you uh, get to your destination. If you have unvaccinated members, coming to your holiday gatherings, you should take extra precautions. And those might include uh, masking and, and effective masking, masking with care such that you have a good seal, preferably with an N95 or a KN95. Um, you might consider gathering outdoors, uh, enforce social distancing. You can increase ventilation if you're gonna be indoors or you can curtail the time that you're gonna be indoors. All of these will contribute to less transmission of the virus. If you're hosting a gathering, you might consider instituting and requiring these simple measures uh, to help save lives of your loved ones. We wish all to move back to that level of normalcy that uh, we miss so much. And I think if you are fully vaccinated, you can have holiday parties with your friends and return to a, a very normal lifestyle. So if everybody at your gathering is, is fully vaccinated, I think you can enjoy yourselves. Um, particularly if you're doing testing before and after the gathering. I feel it is still very risky to have gatherings with unvaccinated people if they're not masks. Uh, until such time, our baseline of infection returns to where it was last spring. Um, this is going to be difficult. And if we're not cautious about taking these precautions, uh, you know, I, I can see that we could promote another surge of the virus. Um, New recommendations on vaccinations included children, uh, children age five to 11. There's 73 million children in our country. Already we've had 5 million infections in children. 700 children have died. <clears throat> that means that less than one in 100 children have, one in 100,000 children have died, but if you, uh, you were infected, one in 7,000 died. As in adults, children are less uh, likely to be hospitalized or become critically ill if they are vaccinated, and such a, it's a strong recommendation. Uh, but probably more importantly, children are also the reservoir or source of spreading COVID to their parents and to their grandparents. And these are the people who are, generally speaking, more vulnerable to the infection. So our success at, at vaccinating this younger group of children will go a long way to keeping them safe, keeping our schools open, and curbing the transmission of the virus in the community. I wanted to talk about variants. Um, currently, the Delta variant remains the dominant variant. Uh, CDPH has done sequencing of the viruses and July, they sequenced 22% of the infections. Uh, and in uh, August, they sequenced 15% of the infections. They're monitoring nine different variants. Uh, the Delta variant is still the major player in California and throughout the country. 98% of the infections uh, in October were from the Delta variant. And they do not feel that any of the other variants are currently listed. Uh, as a variant of concern. So we're still I mean, worried about the Delta variant. Some of you may have heard about new treatments that are out there. Um, Merck has licensed a drug in Europe and that they're using in Europe. And initial data suggests that the treatment is quite effective at reducing severity of illness and reducing mortality. It's not yet licensed in the United States. There's multiple other drugs that are uh, being uh, put forth for testing. And I think it's likely that uh, in the spring, uh, some of these will be licensed and it will definitely have an impact on, on the pandemic. So in summary, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the level of infection in Lake County and the direction we are going in the pandemic. It's very happy to see the decline of uh, test positivity and decline in number of infections, but we still have a huge opportunity on the vaccination front. And I encourage you all to talk openly about this, to share your information from reliable resources, uh, and to talk to your family members and loved ones who aren't vaccinated. It is a huge community effort 
needed to stop this virus, but I'm confident that working together, we can all make, make a huge difference. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me back. And I wish you all safe and healthy holidays and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. Uh, we do have some comments and questions. Let's go ahead and start with uh, Supervisor Paiska. Thank you for coming, Dr. Evans. It's really wonderful to see you again. Um, I'm wondering when Lake County is going to receive the pediatric doses for the five to 11 year olds. Now, I'm going to defer to uh, you, Carol, on that. Do you know? Uh, I don't know if, um, if our director of nursing is in the room or not, but the last I communicated with her, we were still awaiting receipt of the pediatric doses here in Lake County. Is Eileen in the room? Yes, she is. Hi. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you um, yes, just to give an update, as Dr. Evans mentioned on our public health website um, or the phone number where you can call us to get um, the vaccine um, information um, on our site, we keep that updated. We're um, reaching out to uh, uh, folks that are listed on the website um, almost daily to make sure that we are keeping our, our sources up to date. And so right now, Adventist Health is showing that they have um, vaccine for five and up, as is Walmart. Um, at both their Clear Lake locations. And, um, and we are waiting for more. I know Safeway is, is hoping that early next week they'll be able to start here in Lakeport. And so again, this is a great resource to uh, look at our website and we're continuing to update it. It shows right now um, everyone with the 12 and older and we are adding the five to 11s as they come in. Thank you. Um, one of the yeah. other questions, um, and I, I don't know if this is a better question for Sarah, and she's unfortunately not here today, but um, I'm wondering what would be the best indicators to gauge the spread in our community if we have so many people taking at-home tests and not reporting? Um, yeah, I don't have any idea what that percentage is, but I know that that option is available to so many people and they're choosing to take it and, you know, that's one of the resources that we have now, but it, it does impact the data that we're able um, to gauge our response by. So I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Evans. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And, you know, I think as it, it's a very positive thing that these antigen tests are becoming more available because the more testing we do, the more detection we have and, um, the more likely we can be responsible about quarantining when we're infectious. Uh, it does pose a problem to the data in terms of, of the total numbers, but the data can also, it's not gonna change the hospitalization data and the, the death data. So you know, what we're really worried about is not the total number of cases, it's really we're worried about the people who are sick enough to be hospitalized and certainly those who uh, require ICU care. So we're gonna follow that as a, a, um, a bellwether sign of, of how our infection is going. So yes, there might be more cases of infection out there that we're missing, but we're not gonna be missing the hospitalizations. And I, I think that's a much more critical value to follow. Yeah, and do you have an idea on how our hospitals are being impacted currently? So the numbers are, are drifting down in Lake County. They're, they're uh, drifting up in Mendocino County and Sonoma County. They're also drifting down. Um, and, you know, usually when you see an uptick in number of cases, you don't see the hospitalizations until a couple of weeks later. And so, uh, for example, you look over at Mendocino County and see the numbers going up, we can accept, expect to see their hospitalizations to continue to go up as well. You see our numbers going down. If indeed the numbers truly reflect what's there, then we should expect our, our hospitalization numbers to stay down. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? So I did have... Um, some questions and comments. One is I saw something that I'm going to ask for a clarification. I don't think that you can provide that clarification, but in the, um, 
in the PowerPoint presentation, it showed a total of uh, nine deaths in September and two in October. And when I look at our main webpage, it shows 19 for September. And so I'm hoping that you can come back and provide a clarification on what that uh, number exactly is, uh, since there's be a discrepancy between what's put on our website uh, for those uh, time frames and what was provided here. Uh, and not sure what that will do to the numbers overall for the percentage, but I think it's uh, good to make sure that we uh, are on the same page with what numbers we're looking at. Sure. You know, let me just say that Sarah did mention in a report that she, uh, the report of the nine deaths was for a 36 day period of September, October. So it wasn't all of September and October. And that's probably what that's about, Chairman. Okay. Uh, having not made the report, I can't say for sure, but part of the reason she does that is to protect the, um, the patient's privacy so that it's, it, you know, people aren't trying to see who, who is the person that passed from not being vaccinated. Um, and so she, the data, uh, I'm confident that, that the data is accurate um, in terms of the total numbers, uh, but it's not done month by month. So those uh, deaths in October uh, reflect, I think all of October, but only a part of September. Um, and thank you for that clarification. Uh, and if it's possible um, to make a request for the, the next time, if we can put the dates on the actual um, PowerPoint, I may have missed it, but it, I believe I read it as September and October. Yeah. Um, and so just uh, to reduce that possible confusion. And if it's my fault for the confusion, then I apologize. Uh, the other one is, I I'm wondering, uh, there's two other questions. One is uh, a data point that we don't have. We talk about uh, the... Uh, decreasing effects of the vaccine. Uh, is that easy data to look at for people in Lake County who were vaccinated? Because uh, we know when they got vaccinated, uh, they're in a computer somewhere. Uh, and I'm sure we have access to that information to find out once people drop off after the six months, how we can correlate that to the unvaccinated and vaccinated percentages of hospitalization to see if there's a, a correlation there or not, at least the way it's working in our community. Um, I think that that's something I have not seen. Uh, what's the population vaccination of the last six months and what's then what's happening in our hospitals and our mort mortality rate when we're always comparing the unvaccinated and vaccinated. Uh, just to, just to kind of have, I, I think that would be interesting information to look at and might offer a more poignant point of uh, the impacts of the vaccine uh, or the uh, decrease of the impacts of the vaccine based on time uh, past. And my second one is there's been a lot of conversation, and I know that even at the state level, there's this, this conversation and the data might be difficult, but if it's possible in a future uh, agenda when we speak about COVID uh, to talk about um, those who have been impacted and um, had COVID, what is the timeline for the immunity that they had? Do, are there some who may have zero immunity, some that have 100% immunity? Is it three months, six months? Is it longer? I know there's, there's some studies out there. There's some uh, still ongoing studies going, but it's difficult to kind of uh, hammer down what that looks like. And I know we're supposed to wait uh, maybe two months, I think it is, uh, if I'm correct, before you do get vaccinated, if you did have COVID, uh, just, just to have that conversation, because we've had a lot of people impacted uh, and getting sick with COVID and to try to uh, inform them and educate them on what is actually happening with their bodies and what, what, what are they uh, dealing with out in the uh, community where COVID still is. Yeah, I'd be happy to look at that data and present that at the next meeting. Um, let me just say, I love the way you think about, uh, you think like an epidemiologist in terms of, of the way our immunity drifts and if we could look at, at that specifically. I'm sure that data could be extrapolated uh, because we have the vaccination data, but it's, it would take an epidemiologist to take it and sift it and say, you know, we have this many people who, whose immunity is beyond that four month point where they need to be boosted. And we're not looking at the number of boosted people. You know, we're con considering people fully vaccinated if they've had uh, two vaccines or in the case of Johnson Johnson, one vaccine. And that's a much more sophisticated uh, analysis. Uh, and I agree, it, it, it would be nice to have that. 
And at the same time, I would say our, our, our biggest bang for the buck is still getting those who are unvaccinated vaccinated, because those are the people who are much more likely to be hospitalized and much more likely to die. Right. Um, and I, I, I am not putting a timeline on when I would like to see that data, because I don't know how difficult accessing all that data would be. It was just more of in the future, when possible, when it's all able to be collected, uh, if we can have that conversation. Uh, yeah. I, I think of things that I don't necessarily know the difficulties of accessing those things or putting it all together. So and I will uh, pick Sarah's brain on that and see what she can come up with. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we have Supervisor Paiska. Yeah, one question more question. Um, with the vaccination rate and the, un the vaccinated, the unvaccinated, and then the, the booster, is there going to be a change in definition on what vaccination, what fully vaccinated means? Is that going to include people that have the booster or is that going to be a separate category? So I have not seen any guidance from the state on that. Um, you know, I think right now they are still considering people fully vaccinated if they've had the two of the Pfizer and Moderna and one of the Johnson and Johnson. I would expect uh, over time they are going to adjust that, but I haven't seen any guidance in that regard. Okay. Thank you very much. If there's no further comments or questions from board members, let's go ahead and open it up for the public. Anybody in the board chambers wish to speak on this item? Please come up to the microphone. You have three minutes. I would like to direct the, my question to the doctor here. Now you could direct it to the board and, and we can ask the doctor to respond if, if needs be. Okay. Uh, I just would like to uh, ask you perhaps if you are aware of the fact that PCR tests have been by CDC were declared uh, invalid because they cannot differentiate between so-called COVID-19 and or ordinary common flu. And I want to you know, get the answer for that. Uh, you know, supposedly it's going to happen at the end of the year, not prior to that, but there is no test I know of which would identify COVID-19 virus, and that never was one. So that's my question. The other item is perhaps the medical errors statistics for the United States. And that will be something I will have to read. But medical errors cause an estimated 250,000 deaths in the United States annually. Okay, those are medical errors. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. We just should start looking to the beginning of this thing because they were, for starters, you know, we are under censorship. The media, so-called media, disguise, uh, you know, basically put people who have different understanding, even if they're specialists, like the doctors in Kern County initially, they decided that they tested 4,000 people in Kern County. They couldn't find any virus. And that was, of course, on YouTube, and it was taken down within two weeks. It's an ongoing pressure against uh, information which varies from what is the official, official line. And that's the disaster of it, that we don't have the freedom to express various understandings and, and information which should be available. And it's been going on for two years. So like I said, PCR tests, I don't know of any other tests. The man who developed PCR tests declared Mullis, this was his name, that the test, that test cannot be used for identifying any virus. It's not meant for that. He got Nobel Prize for it but he didn't agree with anybody using his test for identifying viruses. And he incidentally died three weeks before a healthy man, three weeks before uh, the, this whole charade started. So the other interesting thing is, is three countries in the world decided to not allow... And your, your three minutes are up. If you can just go ahead and provide your last statement. Excuse me? Hello, up here up here on the board. 
Oh, I can't even hear. Your three minutes are up. Thank you. And so if you can, okay. And Dr. Evans, I know that we've had this conversation before about the um, PCR test. If, if there's anything that you can provide, I know that they are updating the PCR test so that now it can differentiate between COVID, the flu and cold. Uh, but if you can provide more uh, expert uh, so PCR is, is a technology that's been developed to look at genetic material and the genetic material of different viruses is different. We use it not only for viruses, we use it for bacteria. This is a technology that's been very, very well developed, is extremely sensitive and extremely specific. It is not invalid. It is not bad data. It clearly detects the COVID virus with great accuracy, greater than 95% accuracy. And probably the inaccuracy is not from the test, but from the swab. If you don't swab properly, then you're gonna get, uh, you're not gonna get good data. But if you swab properly, it's probably close to 99.99% accurate. And um, it, we're really, really lucky to have this technology. And I do wanna add that, um... According to the CDC, there was an almost 18 percent, I think it was 17.8 or something like that, increase in deaths uh, in the United States in 2020. And so there, to say that there is no virus, uh, then, then please explain to us what people are dying from. There, there, there's very good, strong medical science uh, for what is happening. Uh, whether you agree with some of the actions that we're taking, I think th those things can be debatable. Uh, but the virus itself, it's very difficult when you've lost family and friends uh, and it's getting closer and closer to family and friends uh, to still make the statement that it, it's fake. Uh, and and we're, we're the, your, your time is up. I'm just responding to your comment. Uh, and we did not censure uh, your comment as uh, you stated is a part of the problem as well. Uh, everybody has their three minutes and their ability to come and speak to us uh, in a public meeting. Mr. Chairman, I did want to uh, make a statement about his comment on medical errors. And you know he's right that there are medical errors. Remember that the people who are, are creating the medical errors are humans. You know, Whenever you have humans doing anything, they're gonna make mistakes. And we have lots of, of, uh, of patterns in place to try to prevent errors. And we're much better than we were five years ago or 10 years ago. And we still make errors every day. And I apologize for that, but we're all human. And we'll continue to do the best we can do. Uh, but know that none of us are perfect. Very different than talking about a technology that we know has, has special qualities and we know we can look at that data and be confident with it. Thank you for that, Dr. Evans. Any further public comments in the board chambers before we move on to Zoom, please come to the microphone. State your name and you have three minutes. Joan Moss, I want to know if we, as members of the public, are given accurate information about what is in the vaccines that we are receiving. Thank you. We have not provided you that information from this board. That information is available through the manufacturer and through the CDC and FDA for the, all the reviews that have been had in order to get some of the approvals that they've had, whether it's emergency or uh, non-emergency approvals. And Dr. Evans, if you wanna to add to that. I would only add that we have experience of millions upon millions upon millions of cases and that the safety and efficacy of this vaccine is superb. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's perfect. Uh, it's superb. And it's one of the best vaccines for uh, such a pandemic uh, that we've ever seen. And uh, we're so fortunate to have it in this country and to have re ready availability of it. Um, many countries are still not yet vaccinating their population against this, this disease. And, um, you know, we're incredibly fortunate to have it. Thank you. Let's go ahead and move on to the Zoom room. Let's start with Carlos Bono. Again, state your name and you have three minutes.
You're still on mute. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, first, oh, this is Carlos Bono. I'm a resident of Middletown. And I first would like to uh, let the board and other citizens of Lake County know that a new website called StandUpLakeCounty.org has been started. The website represents a grassroots community group of activists working on the county level to protect and restore our rights to medical choice and freedom guaranteed to us in the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the California Constitution. We also emphatically object to the use of medical mandates for citizens to participate equally in society and the economy. A petition with change.org advocating medical rights in Lake County can be found on the website, and we urge concerned citizens to sign it. We also encourage Lake County residents that have suffered a vaccine adverse event to tell us your story on the form at the website. Now I'd like to address the board on the superb, safe and effective COVID vaccine. First, the VAERS data on the CDC's own website as of November 5th indicates 875,651 reports of adverse COVID vaccine reactions, including 18,461 deaths and 91,982 hospitalizations. The report also shows 29,104 permanently disabled and 20,644 life-threatening side effects from the so-called vaccine. On Friday, a federal judge for the 5th District upheld a ban on the Biden administration's unconstitutional mandate for employers of 100 or more employees being obligated to be vaccinated. Judge Kurt D. Engelhart wrote, from economic uncertainty to workplace strife, the mere specter of the mandate has contributed to untold economic upheaval in recent months. Now, this information about the vaccines is to show that they're completely ineffective and dangerous and life-threatening to many people, especially young people that have hardly any risk from COVID. To vaccinate five to 11 year olds is insanity. Um, as we approach the winter months, more people are getting sick because, and these are people that are fully vaccinated by the way. This is because they're suffering from antibody dependent enhancement. And there, it's only going to get worse. And I want to finalize by stating that anyone who's at experimental gene therapy shot, especially medical professionals and others in position of authority who knowingly coerce, bribe, or otherwise force people to accept this experimental medical procedure without informed consent, will be held liable for crimes against humanity as a consequence of this insanity becomes irrefutable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to do a, a quick pause at this moment and continue with um, public comment uh, very soon. Uh, I need to check in with our CAO. Our room is getting a little crowded. We need to get some seats. We need to figure out how to make sure to social distance for you all. I know that there's an important upcoming. Uh, who, who here is... Um, Who here is for item either 6.3 or 6.4 or 6.5? And I'm sure you figured out we've exceeded the crowd. No, yeah, so I, I'm trying to see if there's some uh, shuffling that we can do, but it looks like the majority of the crowd is here for 6.6. .6. Um, and so if you can give us about five or 10 minutes, we need to figure out how to make sure to uh, adequately uh, make this work uh, so that everybody can participate. Uh, we want to hear from everybody. Just do want to remind you that uh, it is possible to join us on the Zoom room where you will not be missed. You will still be able to provide public comment. Um, and so, again, let's go ahead and take a five, uh, 10 minute break. We'll be back at, uh, at the earliest at 1013. All right. Um, thank you so much, Sam, for uh, your efforts in trying to accommodate everybody. Uh, if we do get more people, please know that there is a television showing outside what is happening, and we are still working on getting the audio done out there as well. Uh, and also, it, it, the doors will remain open. 
Uh, if you're not speaking and you're here for public comment, let's make sure that if there's not enough room in here that you can stay out there, listen in, and we're going to make sure that you can participate. We're not trying to alienate you from the meeting. We just want to try to accommodate as much as we can. Uh, so we're going to come back and continue our 6.2 item. We were not done with our public comments, and we were in the Zoom room. And let's go ahead and continue with Elaine Zacker. And again, apologize to everybody in the Zoom room as well. You don't see us uh, kind of moving around and, and working on things, but thank you very much for your patience. You have three minutes, please provide your name. Oh, I see you're unmuted, but we are not hearing you. Just wanna make sure Supervisor Crandall, can you hear Elaine Zacker? You, you can? Okay, you can't. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, Elaine Zacher, if you can try and solve your uh, technical issues, we'll try and get back to you. Let's go ahead and move on to Swimmy, if you can provide your name and uh, you have three minutes. Hello, good morning, thank you. I am Amanda Rose. I am one of the people that has lived on the land known as Lake County for at least seven years now. I never asked for this virus to be isolated. I do not perceive it as a threat and I do not perceive it as Charlie Evans or the Board of Supervisors business in getting involved with biologics. I do not see evidence for a state of emergency. And as provided by the constitution, no public official, political subdivisions, and neither health departments of health nor the CDC or federal government or public Corporations shall infringe upon our constitutionally protected rights to life, liberty, and property. That being said, I'm looking at a coroner's report from a 15-year-old in Sonoma County who died from his second dose of the Pfizer injection. It is ridiculous to recommend in injections to kids who have innate immunity to this virus, which has a 99% survival rate to everybody. And 81% of the deaths have occurred over 65. So please tell me if you can, where is the state of emergency and to who does it apply? If not, you are all board of supervisors hereby on notice of violation of maladministration of your duties in order to remove the federal state and corporate interference here in Lake County, unless you can provide evidence of a state of emergency. I have given Everyone in the Board of Supervisors, I have provided an evidence package providing FOIA responses from medical authorities and departments of health all over North America and living testimonies from world-renowned doctors proving that there has been no isolation of the virus. And until evidence re exists regarding replication competent virus in human cell cultures, there is no justification for the state of emergency. This is my health and the board of supervisors and Charlie Evans has no business in it. So get out of my health and get back to being my public servants, please. And thank you. I will be submitting more paperwork regarding restoring public trust during a global health crisis. It is a 400-page executive summary from Dr. Henry Ely, and it will give you guidelines as to how to correct course. Otherwise, your notices are in the mail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Next comment is phone 1113. Yes, hi, um, this is Dr. Will Tuttle calling, and um, I'm responding to some of the things you've been saying about the PCR test. Uh, first of all, uh, it's to say that the PCR test is uh, an accurate way of diagnosing this. Uh, again, it goes against uh, countless people, highly respected scientists who have been censored saying that uh, it basically uh, cannot detect uh, a virus and uh, it, for diagnostic purposes. It's, it was never designed by, by uh, Kerry Mullis to do that. And the amplification rate can be manipulated. That's the key thing to understand is that the CDC has been telling labs to uh, run this thing at about 40 uh, amplification cycles, which basically creates uh, false positives on a massive scale 
it's a great way at, at a high level to create a lot of fear and to create a pandemic. And the CDC is even so bold and assumes we're so stupid that they've now publicly said that everyone who's been vaccinated, that the PCR test should only be run at 25 cycles. So unvaccinated people, it's run at 40 cycles. So you get all these people saying, oh, we have all these cases of unvaccinated people. Vaccinated people, it's only run at 25 cycles. You basically get no nobody uh, is ever uh, found with it at that at only 25 cycles. It basically amplifies. We all have some coronavirus in us from the years, and so they can find it. If you amplify it enough, you'll find it in everybody. It's like cancer. You can find cancer in everybody. You can say, oh, you've got cancer. But this is all part of a hoax. It's a, it's a debacle, and it's coming from a high level. But you have to understand that as, as the, our county people, uh, you're responsible. And uh, there's codes in, in, uh, on the books, uh, 18 U.S. Code, Section 2339, uh, is a criminal code, uh, very serious, the life imprisonment for funding and conspiring acts of terror. Uh, Section 802, acts of domestic terrorism resulting in the death of American citizens. Uh, 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 Section 15, uh, U.S. Code 1 to 3, conspiring to criminal commercial activity. And uh, Section 8, market manipulation and allocation. All of these things are happening. Uh, and this will come out eventually. And there's civil codes also. One of the main ones to be aware of is 21 code uh, section 50 to 24, 50.24. It is unlawful to conduct medical research, even in the case of an emergency, without an independent institutional review board approved protocol, including informed consent, free of coercion. You are breaking the law. When you say that these vaccines are superb, uh, and when there's, there's never been any vaccine in the history of vaccines that's been in, even close to as deadly as this, where we have young people now having deadly thrombosis, uh, and, and they're trying to say that, oh, it's just normal to have for kids, they're saying it's normal for kids to have blood clots and so forth. This is absolutely deadly and, and it's criminal activity. Can we get to your final and comment, thank please? Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you very much. Elaine Zacker, I see your hand is up again. Hopefully we've resolved the audio. And if you are speaking, we are not hearing you. I don't know if your microphone is turned off. It's definitely unmuted in Zoom. Uh, not sure if that's a hardware mute versus a software mute. Uh, we do have another hand. There is a phone number on our agenda that you can call in and see if you can call in by the time that we uh, do that. And let's go ahead and go with uh, Julia Bono. Uh, thank you, uh, Board. I, I would like to um, speak to you today. Uh, my name is uh, Julia Bono. Uh, I have a background and degrees in scientific research. Um, I wanted to speak to the board and its audience today about the harms caused by the currently available COVID-19 vaccines that have been reported to the CDC's Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or FARA's database. Um, the latest FARA's data as of uh, November 5th, uh, that's actually uh, just a little bit uh, over 10 days ago, 2021, uh, has uh, 875,651 reports. Uh, among those, there were 18,461 deaths, 91,982 hospitalizations, 97,715 urgent care um, events, 136,785 doctor office visits, 7,984 anaphylaxis events, 10,981 Bell's palsy events, 2,887 miscarriages, 9,094 heart attacks, 12,131 myocarditis, pericarditis events, 29,104 permanently disabled individuals, 4,268 thrombocytopenia low platelet events, 20,644 life-threatening events, 33,259 severe allergic reactions, 10,289 shingles um, events. So um, among these, I have personal experience of an individual who suffered from Bell's palsy uh, just shortly after the event. His, his experience was reported to the CDC by his medical professionals that were treating him. Um, I also uh, have a sister-in-law 
who um, experienced a heart attack, a blood clot in her heart, uh, just shortly after taking the Moderna vaccine. And her experience was also reported to the CDC by her medical professionals. Um, I don't think we can be reported uh, uh, Based on all of this information, usually when there's 50 deaths in a vaccine trial, uh, the vaccine trial is stopped. We now have um, over 18,000 uh, deaths reported. And I think this is um, a case for us to a situation where we need to pause and think rationally about whether the risk of something which is basically a variant of the common cold, since coronavirus has caused the common cold, really justifies this number of vaccine adverse events. Um, uh, you know, it, it's something that we really need to consider seriously and we need to stop representing to the public that these um, vaccines are safe and encouraging people to take them. Um, it is really something that people need to consider the risk that they run when taking a vaccine versus the risk that they run when getting the disease. Um, so uh, that's basically what I had to say. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, I don't see a phone that popped up um, and I apologize, but we're gonna need to move on. And I see another hand up, but we've already had that comment and we're running very far behind. Uh, so we are going to move on to our next item on our agenda. As I don't believe, I just wanna check again in the boardroom. Is there anybody I missed for public comment for the COVID update? All right, thank you very much. Uh, so we're gonna move on to item 6.3, our 9.30 a.m. Consideration of annual mental health advisory board report and presentation fiscal year 2020-21 and Director Metcalf. Mr. Good Chair, it looked like Charlie Evans might've had a final comment. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I just kind of moved on, didn't even say bye. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Evans. <laughs> and you're muted at this moment in time. I know you're behind and I won't speak for a long time, but I did want to comment about the vaccine adverse event reporting system. This is the way the CDC receives reports. Anybody can get on uh, the website and submit a report. By submitting a report of a complication, it does not establish that it was caused by the vaccine. When you have a, and, and the same person who brought this up talked about this being an experimental vaccine. So experimental in my mind means something that's not tested adequately. And before it was ever licensed, it was tested by hundreds of thousands of people. Currently in the United States, we're over 441 million doses. Internationally, we're over 7.5 billion doses. I don't know that we've had an experience with a vaccine on that level. Uh, so whenever you have that many people receiving the vaccine, there is a natural death rate within the country and older people are getting vaccinated. Some of those people are going to be vaccinated just before their day was chosen to pass. And this uh, vaccine adverse event reporting system is the CDC's transparent way of collecting this data. And then they investigate that data. And the investigations of that data have not shown causative effects leading to death. Um, there have been some reports of pericarditis and myocarditis, particularly in young men. Um, and it's been clearly shown that the incidence of the pericarditis and myocarditis is hundreds of times higher in those who get infected with the coronavirus again, leading to the recommendation that your safest bet is to get the uh, coronavirus vaccine. Um, so I hope that clarifies that the vaccine adverse event reporting system does not assign causality. It's a transparent way of reporting so that all your listeners understand that that is the CDC's way of collecting information and looking at what they need to investigate. Um, so good. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much for having me. Dr. Evans, thank you for joining us this morning. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you soon.